So, uh, hello and welcome to everyone. Um, it's nice to see some returning faces. It's also nice to see some new uh, faces that hadn't been here for the uh, previous session, at least the session with me. So, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tenzin Namjong, and I am coming to you from uh, Sarah J Monastery in South India. Okay, there we go. So welcome uh, to all of you. And um, I very much uh, am honored and uh, appreciate this opportunity. Um, so thank you to uh, Mary Ellen uh, and all the good folks there at um, Ocean of Compassion for all their hard work. Uh, yours as well, all the hard work in organizing these sessions. Uh, thank you to all of you who are uh, attending because um, you know, it's a uh, dependent arising, right? Without uh, students, there can be no teacher, there can be no teaching. So all those three come together and are uh, essential to um, for events like this to happen. So now at the beginning uh, of this um, module, uh, I thought it would be good to do some of the traditional uh, preliminary prayers that are done on teaching occasions so I am going to, ooh, uh, Mary Ellen, if I could uh, uh, share screen or make me the co-host. Okay, terrific. Oops. <laughs> okay. So sorry here, oops. Okay, we'll do the extensive teaching prayers. So these prayers are done at the beginning of teachings for a couple of reasons. One is uh, especially uh, this first um, praise to Shakyamuni Buddha, and then afterwards there's some verses about the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, is to sort of get our minds in the right uh, frame uh, to accept the teachings. So we do that by reflecting on the good qualities of the, the Buddha, the, the teacher, uh, the, the Dharma and the Sangha. And then when we uh, see and reflect on the good qualities of those so-called three jewels of refuge, uh, we generate a kind of aspiration to attain those very same qualities within our own uh, mental continuum. And so um, that's one thing. So here we can just recite in English. So again, um, please recite out loud, but um, as you recite, then try mentally to reflect on the meaning of these words to the best of your ability. And those words that you don't know so well, then um, yeah, we can maybe uh, come to learn about the, the definitions and, and what they mean uh, sometime in this course, right? Okay. So the other thing that's uh, very good to do, um, generally, it, it, I think all of you uh, have quite a lot of experience with the Dharma before, but um, we also should just briefly right now set a, a positive motivation um, that we're, we're doing this to benefit ourselves. And uh, also more importantly, perhaps uh, to be of more benefit to others. So as we learn about these uh, various methods, these tools found in the Dharma to bring uh, lasting happiness and peace to ourselves, we'll be also uh, better suited to bring that uh, happiness to others. And of course we set as our uh, ultimate goal, the attainment of complete enlightenment so we can be of utmost benefit for sentient beings. So even here at the beginning, um, while we're still training in the path, uh, even now, we should always keep this, um, this thought of compassion toward all sinning beings in mind. And one way we can do that, um, even when we're receiving teachings like this, is to visualize all the sinning beings in the space around us. And we can think that we're listening to this teaching uh, with all sinning beings. When we uh, sit down to meditate, we can also, you know, uh, visualize all sentient beings in the space around us as well. 
and think that they are uh, doing the practice with us. They're meditating along with us. So um, these little uh, reminders, you know, help to, um, yeah, think about uh, others more. And um, that uh, creates a, a very good habit. Okay, so now one more visualization. We can visualize the Buddha also in the space in front of us. And uh, we can think that, you know, he's here on this occasion. Uh, actually, even better is to think that our guru, um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama or Lama Zobar Rinpoche, if you have a, a, a spiritual teacher, you can uh, think that they are now here uh, to guide us um, and, and teach us. It, it's not just me, right? And um, yeah, then remembering uh, the Buddha's qualities and aspiring to attain those qualities uh, that's then why we uh, pay homage to the Buddha. <clears throat> the guru, teacher, Bhagavan, <clears throat> Tathagata, Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of beings to be subdued, teacher of gods and humans to you, Buddha, Bhagavan, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. The guru, teacher, Bhagavan, Tada, Gada, Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, know of the world, supreme guide of beings to be subdued, teacher of gods and humans, to you, Buddha, Bhagavan, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. The guru, teacher, Bhagavan, Tathagata, Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, know of the world, supreme guide of beings to be subdued, teacher of gods and humans, to you, Buddha Bhagavan, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. When supreme among humans, you were born on this earth, you paced out seven strides, then said, I am supreme in this world, to you who are wise then, I prostrate. With pure bodies, form supremely pure, wisdom ocean like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, Winner of the best, savior to you, I prostrate. With supreme signs, face like a spotless moon, color like gold to you, I prostrate. Dust free like you, the three worlds are not. Incomparably wise one to you, I prostrate. The savior having great compassion. The teacher having all understanding. The field of merit with qualities like a vast ocean. To you, the one gone to thusness, I prostrate. The purity that frees one from attachment the virtue that frees one from the lower realms, the one path, the sublime pure reality, to the Dharma that pacifies, I prostrate. Those who are liberated and who also show the path to liberation, the holy field of qualities with realization, who are devoted to the moral precepts, to you, the sublime community intending virtue, I prostrate. Do not commit any unwholesome actions, Engage in perfect, wholesome actions. Subdue one's own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a defective view, a butter lamp flame, an illusion, a dew drop, a water bubble, a dream, lightning, a cloud. See all causative phenomena like this. By these merits, may transmigratory beings attain the state of all seeing. Subdue the enemy of the faults and be freed from the ocean of samsara, disturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. Uh, so normally they do the, the heart sutra, but we'll not do it this time. Yikes. Okay. So then there's this uh, special um, formulation of taking refuge and going and generating bodhicitta for listening to the Dharma. So you'll see in the italics here, we uh, switch out the words. Normally we say, uh, you know, by the merits of uh, generosity and so forth. But here it's uh, special for listening to the Dharma. <clears throat> I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Assembly by my merits of listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Assembly by my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha 
to benefit transmigratory beings. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so I had heard a few of you were um, coming in new to this module, and I thought there might be some, you know, brand new uh, kind of uh, people. But all of you have some uh, level of experience. But anyway, um, I made a little bit of a um, more general introduction uh, to the kind of overall project of what we're trying to do with our studies, with our practice, with our lives. Um, so I thought to do that first. And then since we are starting a new module, I thought we could then um, talk about uh, and give an overview of what's covered in, the, in this module and um, you know, go over the, the uh, subject area summary sheets <laughs> and uh, the required readings. Uh, some of the feedback that we got from the, the previous module was, um, and my kind of um, feeling as well, is that um, maybe some of you, it's been a, a while since you've graduated. So uh, to be now in a formal uh, study program, uh, it's a, a little bit, um, we're out of practice. So I'm gonna try to um, give you uh, some more structure and um, help you a bit uh, so that we know, um, you know how to study um, and, and hopefully that will make things more effective and you'll, you'll know how to spend your time. How does that sound? Okay. So now I've been experimenting with, um, with using uh, PowerPoint slides. So let's see how this goes, okay? Uh, hold on. Okay, slideshow, oops. Oops, okay. So can, can you see the slide and me? Okay, great. So again, you know, I like to consider myself a big picture guy. <laughs> so um, I think it's useful. Uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama always does this at the beginning of his uh, teachings. Uh, I hope all of you have, have taken the, uh, one of the many opportunities uh, to listen to His Holiness. He's giving um, very many uh, teachings on uh, Zoom and has been over these uh, past months during the, the pandemic lockdowns. So uh, usually um, he always uh, starts his, his teachings with um, this kind of reflection on the um, fundamental human condition. So this is actually from a, an article uh, that was written by him. I was trying to find a quote that encapsulates um, his, his thoughts here. But uh, when he was asked about the meaning of life, then you know, he says the meaning of life is happiness. And so the hard question is not what is the meaning of life? That's an easy question. But the hard question is what makes happiness? Money, a big house, accomplishment, friends, or compassion and a good heart? So this is the question that all human beings must try to answer. What makes true happiness? Okay. So the, the fundamental starting point within Buddhism you know, isn't uh, from uh, a creator God or even the Buddha himself, but it's this observation that all beings uh, want to be happy and want to avoid suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we know, uh, here are some, some quotes from Shantideva. So even those who wish to obtain happiness and overcome suffering will wander with no aim if they do not comprehend the secret of the mind, the principal Dharma. And he also says, although wishing to be rid of misery, they run toward misery itself. And although wishing to have happiness like an enemy, they ignorantly destroy it. Uh, so although we want to have happiness and avoid suffering, uh, we have this um, uh, kind of uh, ignorance that is confused about what actually uh, causes suffering and what actually causes happiness. And because of that, Uh, you know, as His Holiness was, was saying in the, in the previous slide, you know, th those things, uh, money, accomplishment, big house, 
uh, you know, we conceive these to be the, the sources of happiness. We think that they will give us uh, the lasting sort of joy that we seek. But, um, well, um, we're wrong about that, aren't we? And then similarly, you know, we, we don't understand, um, well, when, we, when Shanti Dev is talking here about this uh, wandering with no aim, uh, without comprehending the secret of the mind, there's actually, you know, two levels uh, of, of this secret. There's two uh, levels of understanding uh, that we are confused about. So one is on a more, um, we can say the conventional level, the conventional level of truth, uh, we don't understand uh, karma, the law of cause and effect. And in particular, the, the fact that, uh, you know, suffering uh, comes from our negative actions, our unwholesome actions. And then uh, happiness or success uh, comes from virtuous actions. Okay, so uh, because of that, then uh, we have here, uh, right, this um, praise by Aryanagarjuna to the Buddha saying, you know, enthused by great compassion, you expounded the sublime truth to eliminate all wrong views to uh, you, the Gautam Buddha, I pay homage, right? So, uh, all of you, I think, know this mind of great compassion, which is the, the mind that is, um, you know, motivating all of the Buddha's actions, then uh, this mind is that others be free from suffering, right? Uh, but although the, the Buddha uh, wants all beings to be free from suffering, then, uh, as it says in a, a, another sutra, uh, that the Buddhas do not wash away our sins with water, nor do they remove our sufferings with their hands, nor do they transfer their realizations to another mind stream, but the Buddhas liberate the sentient beings by teaching the reality, okay? So here, uh, Nagarjuna says a, a quite similar, um, you know, thought that, uh, you know, in order uh, to um, liberate the sentient beings from suffering, then uh, expounded or taught the, the sublime truth means, you know, the Dharma, right? In order to eliminate these wrong views, because these wrong views is what is the um, uh, the fundamental root of all of our suffering, all of our problems. Okay, so then the, these wrong views, as I was mentioning, we have uh, the wrong views on these two levels. One is this, um, you know, not understanding the um, relationship between our virtuous and non-virtuous actions and our uh, experience of suffering or happiness. And then uh, a, a more ultimate level of uh, confusion and wrong view is to fundamentally misconceive or um, yeah, believe in a, a mode of existence of our own selves and other phenomena. Um, so this kind of fundamental distortion about the nature of reality uh, also is, is what um, binds us to suffer in samsara. So uh, then, we have this um, next stanza from the Dhammapada. We saw it actually in the preliminary prayers. This is maybe the, the most famous uh, stanza. Um, anyways, from the Dhammapada. Uh, Do not commit any unwholesome actions, engage in perfect wholesome actions. Okay, so those two uh, are talking about the, uh, the, the first level of uh, misunderstanding and wrong views that we have about karma and its uh, you know, cause and effect. And then uh, subdue your mind thoroughly. Uh, this is the teaching of Buddha. So actually to subdue the mind thoroughly uh, means uh, on an ultimate level to understand uh, the reality of ourselves and other phenomena. Okay. And so uh, basically, uh, you know, why this, this stanza, you know, it, it encapsulates the, the Buddha Dharma entirely is because it, it talks about these two levels of, uh, you know, uh, wrong views and how the Buddha then uh, taught to eliminate them. Okay. This is all review, right? <laughs> so then we have, you know, subdue your mind thoroughly. So that's why, you know, in, in Buddhism, uh, the mind is very much emphasized. Actually, the, the first module with many, many of you joined us for is, you know, the mind and its potential. So, uh, why then is the, the mind emphasized? Why was it first? 
so here again, the dilemma. This is actually from the exam questions that we gave for module one, but this quote for the dilemma. There are two reasons why the mind is important to understand, uh, sorry, why is it important to understand the nature of the mind? One is because there's an intimate connection between mind and karma, okay? So uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll get into this in, in a minute, but yes, it, because of our mind and whether our mind is positive or negative, uh, that then determines the kind of karmic uh, direction uh, and strength of our actions. And then the other is that our state of mind plays a crucial role in our experience of happiness and suffering. So uh, this, mm, we can see even in the sort of present moment, depending on how we uh, you know, think about our uh, current situation, then that makes um, you know, the experience uh, either more happy or we can bear uh, kind of uh, suffering physical situations or uh, we can compound our uh, suffering uh, physical situation with uh, mental suffering. So I uh, often give a um, uh, quite simple uh, example just of being in a, a hot room, right? So we can imagine uh, during a heat wave, uh, the air conditioning breaks and we're in the hot room sweating and you know maybe it's so unbearable, we complain to everyone, right? It's, uh, it's hell. Uh, but uh, those people who go to a sauna, right, they might even pay a lot of money to be in a, a room that's even hotter than a, a room that where the a AC is broken. And, uh, you know, they very much enjoy that. They, they are sweating. Uh, they might even turn up the heat or, you know, add water to the, the coals to, to make it even hot, you know. Uh, so the, the experience, um, of being in a hot room is the same for those two people, but depending on how uh, they're, they're thinking about it, then uh, one uh, sees it as a good thing, one can uh, see it as a bad thing. So um, now in our uh, own spiritual path, uh, later we'll get into the, the whole teachings on mind training, but um, the experience of, of suffering, when we can, uh, experience our suffering with a mind of uh, bodhicitta and think that, you know, we're, we're bearing this hardship, we're uh, experiencing the suffering so that we can, uh, you know, take away the sufferings of all sentient beings, do a kind of um, mind training practice like tonglen, giving and taking, then, uh, you know, it, it becomes, um, uh, well, one, bearable, right? Our mind doesn't, uh, you know, freak out. And two, uh, it can actually, um, yeah, help us along the, the, the path to liberation and enlightenment uh, by generating uh, a positive uh, mind, an extremely positive mind of bodhicitta. Um, so anyway, taking care of our mind uh, in this sense then can actually help uh, even our current situation. Oops, oh, and there, oops, I've already given that second stanza. I meant to uh, cut and paste it, but I just uh, copied it. Okay. So now uh, then um, more on uh, these, these stanzas, uh, I think I also mentioned in the first module, but uh, here, uh, phenomena are created by the mind. The mind is principle. It comes before action. If one carries a good heart and then speaks, happiness follows like a shadow follows the body. Phenomena are created by the mind. The mind is principle. It comes before actions. If a person speaks with a bad motivation, afterwards, suffering arises for that person like a cart follows an ox. Okay. So this is why we uh, have this emphasis on uh, motivation and to set a good motivation before everything we do, and uh, especially before uh, receiving Dharma teachings. Um, so we'll get into that in a little bit, okay? Uh, so then uh, this is just some review of the, the first module, okay? Uh, because, you know, we we're talking about mind and its potential. So just so we're on the same page then, you know, we were talking about the mind as being clear and knowing, uh, clear in the sense of, uh, you know, a mirror, which, uh, you know, a mirror, depending on what you put in front of it, then it can reflect uh, different things, 
right? If you put an apple in front of it, it reflects an apple. If you put a pencil in front of it, it reflects a pencil and so forth. So depending on certain causes and conditions, then the, the, the mirror can appear in different ways. Similarly, depending on various causes and conditions, the mind can arise as compassion or anger. The mind can perceive you know, sounds, it can perceive forms. Um, so all these different possibilities are there. The mind is none of those things, right? But uh, can, due to causes and conditions, appear in those various aspects, right? And then knowing, uh, you know, in the clear knowing means the sense of being aware, right? Um, <clears throat> so this uh, type of awareness is uh, fundamentally different from material objects, right? So um, therefore, we in the Buddhist conception of mind, then the mind is Im immaterial. So it's not the brain, right? And then uh, the mind is beginningless. So uh, here, uh, the, the reason for that is, well, we have uh, material objects and then we have mind. And the mind is uh, seen as a separate category of phenomena. So just like material objects, they have what's called a substantial continuum, right? So the substantial continuum of the tree, you know, if we, if we go back, it came from a sprout. That sprout came from a seed. The seed came from, you know, in, inside the fruit. The fruit came from a previous tree and so forth. So all of the, the material things, it has a kind of, uh, you know, substantial continuum, right? The mind too has its own substantial continuum. And every moment of mind uh, is preceded by a previous moment of mind, okay? A uh, moment, a previous moment of uh, physical matter cannot give rise to uh, an awareness. This is just a kind of um, axiomatic within the, the, the um, Buddhist worldview. But because of that, since every moment of mind needs a previous moment of mind, then the mind is beginningless. And in the future, uh, you know, the, the mind also, that, that continuity cannot be severed. And that is why uh, past and future lives, rebirth and so forth are, uh, how do you say, posited in uh, the traditional Buddhist view. Okay. So that is the mind. And then we had the, the uh, its potential, right? So the, the mind's potential, then, um, well, it, it draws on this concept of Buddha nature. So Buddha nature is that all sinning beings have the, a potential to attain enlightenment. Uh, so why is that? Because those obscurations that prevent us from attaining enlightenment, the causes of suffering and so forth, are dependent on other factors. They're empty of inherent existence. They are not inherently part of the mind, okay? And furthermore, those obscurations are rooted in this distorted view of reality. Hmm? But that distorted view of reality, right? It's, it's uh, opposite, the truth of reality. That can be discovered. And then this uh, understanding of the truth, it is the, the direct antidote to the obscurations. Therefore, those obscurations can be abandoned and the abandonment is the attainment of Buddhahood. You understand? So that's why we can all achieve enlightenment. Okay. So we all have that potential to be enlightened. But to awaken this potential, uh, you know, we need the, the outer and, and uh, oh, I should have inner there, the outer and inner conditions. Okay. So here, uh, Shantideva again says, relying on the boat of a human body, free yourself from the great river of suffering. Because this boat is difficult to attain again, do not sleep now, fool. Chandigirti says, now I have independence and favorable conditions. If I do not take full advantage of this time, I'll plunge into the abyss and fall under the control of others who will lift me out. So in order to awaken this uh, Buddha nature, this potential to achieve enlightenment, uh, well, because the direct antidote to all the obscurations is this wisdom that realizes the ultimate nature of reality, okay? To realize that, well, it's quite difficult. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we need the outer conditions of having you know, met 
um, with the correct explanations of the ultimate nature of reality, right? Because things appear to us in a mistaken manner, right? They appear to be inherently existent, truly existent. And so uh, unless it's sort of pointed out to us that, oh, maybe, um, you know, things aren't as they appear, then, uh, you know, we might not um, uh, sort of inquire uh, beyond the, the mere appearances that we face, right? So we need sort of access to the teachings. And then we also need the um, intelligence to e examine the teachings, to study and practice and so forth. So uh, basically, uh, all of these uh, favorable conditions are very uh, hard to get. And um, well, we have them. And so this was the, the last sort of teaching in the, the first module, uh, the teaching on the precious human rebirth. So now that we have these outer and inner conditions, what do we have to do with it? We have to make best use of it. And you know, uh, as Chantakuti is saying, uh, taking uh, full advantage uh, while we still have this opportunity. Hmm. Oh, and so now, uh, okay, this actually, we're getting into uh, something else. Oops. Okay. So we all on the same page? That's all review for all of you? <laughs> okay. Um, so now, how's our time? Okay, good. So now, yes, we want to take uh, full advantage of this opportunity afforded to us by the precious human rebirth. So now we've all uh, decided to uh, take time out of our busy schedules and uh, join this course. And now we're in module three. And so now I'm going to switch uh, to the subject area. Oops, where is it? Okay the subject area summary sheets. Okay. So now module three presenting the path. Uh, all of you have this, right? Have you looked at it before? So, um, hmm. I think it's uh, important, you know, we always start from the kind of uh, big picture and then, uh, you know, get more and more granular. Uh, I don't know who was it who just uh, said, oh, maybe I can teach them astrophysics. Um, I'm not gonna teach astrophysics, but actually the, the way of kind of studying, and we'll talk about how to study more uh, later, <clears throat> but um, the great physicist from um, Caltech, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, who you may know, um, He's now passed away, but uh, he came up with this, this technique that is now, um, you know, there's a lot of articles on it, the, the Feynman technique. And uh, this was a, a technique about how to, to learn about difficult uh, concepts. And uh, yeah, basically it would be for, for any particular concept uh, to, well, as they say, the, the best way to learn something is try to teach it to someone else. So here um, we need to, uh, sort of understand what are the things that we need to learn. So uh, here we have this description, get an overview of the entire Tibetan Buddhist path to awakening, hear the life story of the Buddha and study the basic teachings of Buddhism, discover the unique system of putting Buddhist philosophy and practice into, uh, sorry, in, into practice contained in the Lam Rim or graduated path to enlightenment. So then we have these topics, the life story of the Buddha, short history of Buddhism, the correct way to listen to the teachings, and then the stages of the path to enlightenment, the lower scope, the middle scope, including the Four Noble Truths, and the higher scope. Okay, <clears throat> so now, um, yeah, those bullet points there, okay, one thing you can do. Uh, maybe you can do this. You make a Word file, or if you, if you like, uh, you know, a physical notebook, okay? Um, those uh, four bullet points, and then the, the last one has three sub bullet points, right? Maybe you can have a, a category for all those. 
Okay. So within this, this module, uh, you know, you're going to be learning about those things. So already from the beginning, then, you know, you can write on the, the, the top of one page or one section, life story of the Buddha. Okay. So at the end of the session, <laughs> now remember, this DB course, um, if things go well, then uh, you'll be qualified to teach this course again, you know, to, to students in the future, right? So uh, start now. Don't wait until the, um, the, the end when you graduate. But when I say start, you know, imagine that you're now uh, tasked with giving a, a lecture and teaching someone about the life story of the Buddha, right? And so what will you want to, to know? And then, um, you know, what are the gaps? What are the questions that, that students might have then? And then, you know, try to fill those gaps. So with each of these, these kind of points, you know, make sure that you, uh, you know, can say things in a, a quite um, complete manner uh, about all these topics, right? Hmm? Okay. So then we have the suggested time for the module. Okay, we're, uh, let's see what happens. We now have eight uh, classes uh, scheduled and then we're gonna do some meditation and retreat afterwards. Um, but let's see how, how we go. So then we have these required integration practices. So we have these meditations, uh, the meditation and renunciation, bodhicitta and emptiness. Then we have uh, other integration practices Memorization of a short lamb rim prayer, such as foundation of all good qualities. So I'm telling you now. So um, you can start now. I have any of you memorized the foundation of all good qualities or another lamb rim prayer? Yes? Terrific. Okay. So uh, if you have already, uh, let's say you've memorized foundation of all good qualities, then maybe you can, you know, don't just say, okay, finished, but uh, maybe you can do like three principal aspects of the path or um, yeah, another one, okay? If you need suggestions, let's say you've done foundation of all good qualities and the three principal aspects, then yeah, we can do other things, okay? Then we have the, uh, the Lime Room Retreat, three days. Uh, so then suggested, uh, integration practices. Yeah. The meditation on four noble truths and review meditation on stages of the path and a Copan style lamb room course. Okay. Let's see. Then we have these required readings. So all of you, I think have been sent out the uh, PDF packet that has, uh, these, three um, articles in it, right? Then the Wish Fulfilling Golden Sun, um, do you have that as well? If not, it's uh, available uh, for download on Lama Yeshe Wisdom Archive. Um, Essence of Tibetan Buddhism, I've seen the book. I don't know if that PDF is available. Then the book's not including it in the DB materials. So this liberation in the palm of your hand, um, I'm not sure if you own that yet, but uh, if you don't, then uh, yeah, please do so. It's um, it's it's good. It'll be your kind of um, uh, source material uh, for the rest of this discovering Buddhism course. Uh, it's available um, for for ordering online. I'm, I'm sure. So if you haven't already then um, yeah, please order it. Wisdom Energy, I'm also not sure. I've seen the book. I don't know if it's available in PDF, but uh, that's also good to do. And then, um, yeah, these further suggested readings, some of these like Virtue and Reality is available on um, the Lama Yeshe Wisdom Archive as a, a free uh, download. And then some of these other things, well, Mm, yeah, if, if you have access to them, it's good. 
But basically, these are all just different presentations of the Lamrim or the, the stages of the path to enlightenment. So maybe uh, if you don't have these, you might have other Lamrim texts. You might have the Lamrim Chenmo. You might have, um, yeah, maybe uh, Geshe Luden's uh, Lamrim commentary. So um, these are just kind of suggestions, um, but they're not uh, required. And then there's some uh, suggested videos here on the three principal aspects of the path. Okay. So, sorry, a little bit nuts and bolts here. Oops. Okay. So now, um, let's see. It is 8.23 and we're gonna have discussion groups. <laughs> but right now, I'm not sure if we have anything to discuss. <laughs> um, hmm. Okay, what I'm going to do is in the uh, subject, yeah, in the uh, subject area summary sheets, what were we talking about? We have the, um, the life story of the Buddha, then we have a bit of the history of Buddhism, then we have, you know, how to listen and study the teachings, right? So normally, uh, when we start at the beginning of uh, Lamrim, then uh, it talks about uh, the sort of three um, greatnesses, right? Or the, these three kind of main outlines, where it talks about the uh, greatness of the, the teacher, the greatness of the teaching, and then uh, how to listen, um, yeah, and explain uh, a teaching that is endowed with those two greatnesses, okay? So as I think many of you know, uh, in the Lamrim, when it talks about the greatness of the teaching, or sorry, the teacher, it talks about uh, Atisha, Atisha's life story. Um, but now here in this module, we have, uh, you know, one of our, um, our required kind of uh, subject areas is the, the life story of Buddha. So I thought, you know, in a kind of similar vein, because even all the Lamrim topics, uh, you know, those are those were taught by the Buddha. So here now, when we start this module, uh, we can think that we're doing that same um, <clears throat> kind of way of teaching by the great Indian um, monastery, uh, Vikramala Shila, talking about the greatness of the, the, the teacher and the greatness of the teaching, but uh, the kind of root of all the teachings and, and the sort of root teacher uh, in this age of the Buddha's dissemination, uh, the, the Buddha's teaching dis dissemination is, you know, Shakyamuni Buddha. So maybe we can go into his uh, life story uh, right now. And then, um, yeah, maybe just break off into little uh, discussion groups after that. Okay. All right. So, of course, a, a full biography of the, um, the, the Buddha would, uh, you know, take a very long time. But um, I'll just give some of the main uh, kind of points here. So I think many of you know, the, the Buddha was uh, born in uh, North India, uh, well, sorry, actually in present-day Lumbini, uh, which is uh, right across the Nepal uh, border. Uh, he was born um, over 2,550 years ago, and he was born into a uh, royal family. So his father was uh, a king. And uh, at that time, then there were uh, various uh, astrologers or um, soothsayers you see that that word soothsayers um yeah astrologers people who are making predictions and uh, they they told uh, the the buddha's father the king 
that um, <clears throat> you know, the son, uh, Prince Siddhartha, uh, would grow up to be uh, either a great religious leader or uh, a great king. And so uh, the king at that time, uh, wanting, of course, his, uh, his dynasty to remain and his kingdom to flourish, uh, then uh, wanted uh, his son to follow in his footsteps and become a great king. And so had this idea that, okay, I will now shelter uh, my son and uh, totally spoil him and get him, um, yeah, just uh, mm, drowning in the kind of luxuries of the, the palace. And, uh, you know, he'll become so accustomed to that that he'll never uh, then want to leave. Uh, he will never have these thoughts to, uh, you know, leave the palace life and, uh, you know, become a religious leader. So uh, then for the first part of the, the Buddha's life, or Prince Siddhartha's life, he uh, never left the palace. And um, uh, yeah, was um, you know, taught in the, the traditional uh, education system, uh, ex excelled in all of his studies, also learned uh, you know, archery, and you know the 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 skills of of warfare, everything needed uh, to become a, a great king at that time. Uh, then, uh, at one point, since the Buddha had never uh, left the palace, uh, one day uh, he is overcome by his curiosity and has his attendant uh, sneak him out of the palace one day. And uh, when he snuck out of the palace, then he saw. The, the four uh, sites for the first time. And so at first he you know, sees a, an old person. And since he had never uh, you know, seen th these people, uh, an old person before, he asks his attendant, oh, what happened, right? You know, the, the person is hunched over and, and having trouble walking, sees uh, that they're in a lot of suffering. And then his attendant uh, tells him, well, uh, they're old. Prince Siddhartha then asks, oh, well, is this, is this the only one like this? Are there more? And uh, of course, then uh, the attendant says, explains that no, everyone uh, gets old. Uh, he sees a sick person, same kind of thing. He asks the, um, the attendant, um, you know, is this, is this common? Is this the only, you know, are there more like this? And of course, the attendant says, no, there, there's actually many uh, sick people in the land. And then he sees a, a dead body. And, um, you know, the person not moving, being carried off. And uh, then is explained that uh, all, all beings are, are going to die. So here, you know, we, we had in Nagarjuna's praise to the Buddha, enthused by great compassion, right? So uh, even at this time, uh, the Buddha then, uh, you know, is taken by these very, um, uh, you know, obvious forms of suffering that he's seeing for the first time. Uh, then on his way back to the palace, he, he sees the, the fourth site, which is a, a renunciate, a sannyasi, who is, uh, you know, wearing uh, just the uh, sort of simple uh, garb, uh, rags, if you will, of, of a, a renunciate. And uh, he asks the attendant, uh, well, who is this person? And the attendant explains that this is someone who has left behind the worldly life to uh, attain or you know, search for uh, the liberation of all suffering, liberation from all suffering. So the prince goes back and meets his father, the king, and uh, you know, relates to his father uh, these the sights that he's seen and asks his father, oh, well, father, you're the most powerful uh, person in this land. Do you have the power to uh, you know, put an end to old age, put, it, uh, put an end to sickness and death? And uh, of course the father says, uh, you know, sorry, son, no, I don't. And so this um, you know, remained with the, the young prince and um, eventually that formed his uh, motivation to leave behind the uh, palace life so that he could find uh, the means uh, to uh, truly uh, free uh, himself and others of this kind of suffering. So uh, later, 
important part of the, the Buddhist life story. But, uh, you know, he does get married. He does have a child. Um, and then, um, might be a bit controversial, but uh, one night he then decides, uh, well, uh, enough is enough. And he leaves the palace. He sneaks out in the middle of the night. And then uh, there's a very um, famous scene you'll see often depicted uh, in murals in various monasteries where the Buddha is cutting off his hair. And uh, this shows the uh, act of, uh, you know, renouncing the worldly life. After that, he uh, travels around North India and uh, learns from the sort of most renowned teachers at that time. And uh, it is said that he excels in the various teachings that are being given. And uh, although he masters the, the, the teachings that he had received, he also realizes that uh, those teachings don't represent a, um, you know, the, the true liberation from all of suffering. Uh, later, we'll get into this, but uh, it is said that uh, those teachings that he received uh, were teachings on how to, to gain the, the so-called form and formless absorptions. So uh, later, we'll talk about the attainment of shamatha or the calm abiding mind. And then with that calm abiding mind, uh, you can get to a point where, um, yes, you're in just this meditative absorption. And these meditative absorptions uh, actually to uh, achieve them, then um, a little bit of terminology, but all of the uh, afflictions of the desire realm. So we're in the desire realm right now, okay? Uh, to attain these form and formless realm absorptions, the afflictions of the desire realm are uh, suppressed, <clears throat> right? They, uh, you know, cannot um, become manifest in your uh, continuum, as long as you, you have this, uh, this um, absorption, and that absorption has not degenerated. So then, um, you know, those uh, absorptions, you get into a point where um, it's, well, the, the first few, they're very blissful. And then uh, the, when you get into the, the, the formless absorptions, it's a, a, a neutral feeling, right? Because even the feeling of bliss, it has a, a, an aspect of disturbing the mind on a very subtle level. So the, the formless absorptions, then uh, there's just this kind of neutral feeling. And then eventually you, you reach what's called the, the peak of psychic existence, which is the, the kind of highest and most subtlest uh, mind within psychic existence. But it's still in psychic existence. But many uh, you know, meditators, they confuse the, this state of a, a very, very peaceful, neutral kind of mind that uh, you know, is, is totally absorbed in its object. They confuse that with the attainment of liberation. Anyway, so the Buddha uh, achieves that, but then uh, has a kind of misgiving and understands that uh, you know, that is not the uh, ultimate form of liberation. And so uh, you know, continues on and practices uh, you know, by himself. At that time, uh, he has uh, five, five companions and they all go off into the forest and are sort of meditating and practicing on their own. At that time, they were engaged in a lot of ascetic practice. So uh, many of you will have seen this uh, depiction of the Buddha that's just skin and bones. So there's a very famous um, depiction of this that's actually his, ho his holiness's uh, favorite uh, kind of uh, image. Uh, it, there's a, a replica of it in the uh, palace in Dharmasala. Anyway, also when you go to uh, Thailand, Southeast Asia, this uh, kind of form of the Buddha is very uh, common. So at that time, it is said that, you know, the Buddha was eating just one grain of rice uh, per year. <laughs> okay. So he becomes, uh, you know, very, very emaciated. Then uh, after uh, five years of practicing in this way, uh, you know, he hasn't uh, attained the ultimate goal of enlightenment. And um, one day he collapses and he has this kind of uh, realization that, okay, this very uh, harsh asceticism is not the way to achieve enlightenment. Then uh, as he kind of wakes up from having passed out, 
uh, he comes across uh, Sujata, a, um, a kind of um, a young girl who uh, gives the Buddha uh, some kheer. So kheer is an Indian sweet made out of uh, you know, milk and, and, and sugar and, and uh, rice. Um, the Buddha eats that and uh, then is rejuvenated. Then after that, he uh, goes uh, across the river uh, to um, a Bodhi tree. Um, and um, this is in Bodh Gaya. You can actually, these days, uh, they have the place uh, where the Buddha was practicing asceticism, or at least they say, <laughs> the tour guides say it's the place. <laughs> but in any case, um, then there's the river that he crosses. And then uh, you can see the place where uh, actually the, the original tree is uh, no longer there, but it is said that um, you know a um, descendant of that tree uh, is there. A kind of um, you know clipping from that tree was taken to Sri Lanka, and then uh, later a clipping of that tree was taken back to Bodh Gaya. So in any case, uh, the Buddha then sits uh, beneath this uh, tree, and uh, you can see in the normal depiction. Oh, there's a light in front, so you can't see, but the the Buddha has his hand down like this, right? This is called the Earth Touching Mudra. And he says, you know, as he sits down under the tree, he says, uh, okay, I'm not getting up until I achieve the final goal. Hmm? Then uh, through that night, then it is said that, um, you know, the Maras uh, attacked him. And, um, well, the Maras, there's different explanations of this. Then, you know, sometimes it's translated as demons. Uh, so, of course, you can have the external um, kind of personification of those demons. But um, more generally speaking, the, the demons that we have to face are our internal afflictions. So um, both are okay to think about. But in any case, this external personification of the, 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 the delusions then uh, asks the Buddha, you know, well, uh, who are you? Uh, what makes you uh, think you can achieve enlightenment? Uh, have you, uh, you know, done all you need to do in terms of accumulating the causes for enlightenment? And that earth-touching mudra, then, uh, you know, he's asking uh, the, the earth goddess, right, who's a um, very, very long, long life. And so asks, you know, the earth goddess to bear witness that the Buddha himself has uh, accumulated all the, the causes for enlightenment. And so that's the significance of that earth-touching mudra. Then uh, throughout the night, uh, you know, he meditates. And uh, at one point, uh, you know, Mara is, uh, you know, trying more and more things to create obstacles for the Buddha's attainment of enlightenment. At one point, uh, it says that he showers down uh, arrows, which through the Buddha's um, practice of love and compassion, then turn into flowers. So that's also a nice imagery. But in any case, uh, through the night, the Buddha is meditating. And uh, it is said that just before dawn, he achieves enlightenment. And um, yeah, becomes the Buddha. Then uh, for the first uh, seven uh, weeks after the Buddha's enlightenment, um, he actually remains silent. And so there's a nice... Um, Stanza here, I'm going to share again. Okay, we can share from this, oops. Okay, here we go, yikes. Uh, so uh, the first thing he utters after he achieves enlightenment is a profound, peaceful, elaboration free, clear light and non-composite, such is the nectar-like dharma I have discovered. Finding no one who can fathom this teaching in silence, I'll retire into the woods. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, then, yeah, there's a, a lot of commentary. We'll get into that uh, later. But uh, the point and the significance now is, uh, you know, this um, appearing to, for seven weeks, not teach 
is now a practice that's continued on to this day. And actually why uh, Mary Ellen now um, you know, offers a mandala at the beginning of the, the teachings, there is this tradition that uh, you know, not, someone only teaches uh, when requested. So this, um, this aspect that the Buddha showed after achieving enlightenment of uh, you know, remaining silent for seven weeks, well, of course, uh, you know, the Buddha, enthused by great compassion, taught the sublime dharma to you know, uh, eliminate all wrong views. So the, the Buddha always had the intention to teach. So it wasn't that you know, he was just gonna remain silent, right? But rather showing this aspect of remaining silent for the seven weeks uh, kind of gives us some pause that uh, what these teachings are getting at is a very sublime uh, truth that is profound and difficult to fathom. And so uh, by understanding this, uh, it gives us a kind of uh, you know realistic view that uh, yeah we shouldn't uh, then expect to become masters and uh, you know have a realization uh, in our first uh, you know, week in our first year uh, so we should have uh, patience and a very long term uh, kind of perspective that um, you know no matter how long it takes uh, we're going to do what's needed. To achieve enlightenment and it's not going to be an easy task but it's going to be very worthwhile because the the goal that of full enlightenment is uh yeah so wonderful and it's worth it so then uh, after the seven weeks of remaining silent then the the buddha <clears throat> he goes uh actually travels to uh, sarnath uh, close to varanasi and um, actually there, uh, he was tra uh, training with five other um, companions, right? And um, when he then eventually took the, the kir and ate, his five companions were very disappointed in him. And he thought, oh, they thought, oh yeah, you know, uh, Siddhartha or Gautama, he's, uh, you know, totally fallen away from his practice. Uh, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, caved in, he's eaten. And so when, when they first see uh, the Buddha approaching, they kind of shun him. Uh, but later, they sort of see, uh, okay, there's, there's, there's something different, he's glowing. <laughs> and then it is said that uh, actually, uh, Indra, the, the king of the gods, and Brahma, uh, another uh, god, um, offer the Dharma Chakra, to the Buddha, and then the Buddha um, teaches uh, this first uh, so-called turning of the wheel of Dharma in that he teaches the Four Noble Truths. And then, uh, you know, the Buddha was enlightened at the age of 35. Uh, he then passed away at the age of 80, or we should say took the aspect of passing away. And then for those last 45 years of his life, he, uh, you know, teaches all over uh, Northern India so we'll get into this uh, later uh, in that first article by uh, uh, Lama Yeshe. Then uh, Lama Yeshe is describing how, how then these teachings are categorized. And one way of categorizing them is the so-called three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. So the, the first turning of the wheel is, uh, you know, typically described at that teaching at Varanasi, where the Buddha teaches the Four Noble Truths. Then we have the second turning of the wheel at uh, Rajgir, right, uh, Vulture's Peak. And uh, there it teaches the, um, yeah, profound view of emptiness. And then the third turning of the wheel, uh, they say at Vaishali, then uh, he resolves some of the apparent contradictions between the uh, first and third, sorry, the first and second turning of the wheel, okay? So we'll, we'll get into those third turning of the wheels um, in the next class. Uh, so now your homework is to read, uh, at the very least, that article by uh, Lama Yeshe. I think um, it's only a few pages. And then uh, it's also good to uh, read the second article uh, by, I think it is uh, Geshe Zuppa, that gives a, a presentation, a beginning presentation of the stages of the path or the line room.
Okay. So now we have 13 minutes left. I've gone into your breakout room time. But yeah, let's let's do it. Let's let's have a at least a short breakout room. Um, if we had more time, oh, so this is important also. You know, when you're uh, attending teachings, uh, especially when you attend teachings by uh, His Holiness, oftentimes there is uh, uh, time left at the end of the teaching where the audience can ask questions. So it's very interesting to um, listen to these questions, listen to what people are asking again and again. And um, you know, later when, when you become teachers, right? Uh, some of these very same questions that are asked of His Holiness, they might be asked of you one day. <laughs> so it's good to make a note of these questions and then, um, yeah, pay attention to the answer. And um, I always uh, say that I, I, li I like questions very much. So when you're now going through your uh, studies, then also the questions that come to mind, you know, when you're doing a reading and something is like, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, something that maybe surprised you, uh, something that maybe goes against what you had been thinking before, then also make a note of that. And then sometimes, uh, you know, just like this third turning of the wheel, right? Where there are some apparent contradictions between uh, what the Buddha taught on one particular occasion in the first turning of the wheel, and then uh, something that he teaches at a, a subsequent occasion. And then these apparent contradictions need to then be resolved, okay? So a lot of what we're, we're um, trying to do with our studies is, you know, we read extensively. Then within these teachings, we come across uh, things that are, uh, you know, on the face of it, contradictory. And learning then how to resolve these apparent contradictions uh, then um, is one of the important skills that uh, we're acquiring uh, during our studies, okay? So uh, one thing in these uh, breakout rooms, then um, I, I wanted you to bring up uh, with each other some of these uh, questions that come up. And um, well, one that comes up a lot is uh, one, one thing that's a little bit controversial is this um, Buddha leaving his wife and child and going off, uh, you know, to pursue his, um, his path. And so, you know, <laughs> in some of the beginner's courses, you know, we have, uh, yeah, some controversy about this. Like, you know, the, the, the prince was a deadbeat dad and, you know, how could he do this? <laughs> and, uh, um, I don't know. What do we think about this? Hmm. So that's one thing uh, I, I wanted you all to, to sort of um, think about. Uh, the other thing that's sort of um, good, and I think all of you had this to a greater or lesser extent, is you know this time when the Buddha leaves the palace for the first time and sees the suffering and then kind of plants the seed for him to ask more, what is beyond this? Um, so I think all of us in our own journeys, we had a, a kind of similar experience where we, we have this kind of doubt come up for the first time that, oh, wait a minute, those, um, those things that I thought were going to lead to happiness, maybe like His Holiness is talking about accomplishment, a big house, money, we get the, the, the kind of um, doubt that, oh, maybe the strategy I've been undertaking uh, for my happiness isn't the one that's going to work. So anyway, that uh, is something good for personal reflection. Anyway, I've totally taken up the time now. So maybe let's just, so we know how to do, let's go into breakout rooms for five minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, I think on later, um, later sessions, I will... Uh, yeah, be more mindful of leaving better time for this. Okay, so Mary Ellen, could you uh, organize that? How many do we have? We have 15 people. So 
will I be in a breakout room? <laughs> anyway, you you organize it, it, it groups of what three or four, and then uh, you know maybe in that that time, maybe maybe all we'll have time for is a little bit um, int introducing yourself to the people in the in the breakout room, and maybe you can talk about your own experience of quote unquote leaving the palace. Okay. How's that? And we'll come back uh, at maybe, yeah, three minutes before the end of the session and we'll do a dedication. Okay. So I think we only have seven more minutes. So yeah, like five minutes and come back and do a brief dedication. Okay. Thank you. So great. We are over time, so I appreciate all of your um, patience. So now we can just do a brief um, dedication. So this is one of the very um, most common uh, dedications at the end of the teaching. So we can think like this. May whatever virtue I've collected benefit the teachings and all transmigratory beings and may especially cause the essence of perfect pure Lausanne Drakpa's teachings to shine forever. Um, yeah, so that, that's totally fine. Um, we can also just dedicate uh, that uh, all sentient beings, you know, quickly be free of all their suffering and uh, achieve the state of uh, complete enlightenment. And uh, we can also dedicate for the long lives of the spiritual friends, particularly His Holiness Dalai Lama and Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and that all their holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. And then um, also all those who are sick, uh, whether with uh, you know coronavirus or any other kind of illness, may they quickly be free from all their uh, sicknesses and whatever illnesses there are in the world, may they never occur again. And then also those beings who recently died, may they attain a uh, good rebirth, either in a pure land where they can achieve enlightenment, or again, as a perfect human rebirth, meet with the Mahayana teachings and Mahayana uh, guru and attain enlightenment in their very next lifetime. Okay, so thank you very much. So again, uh, your homework, we're gonna be uh, sort of directive about this, but uh, the, the first two articles in the packet um, that you've all been given, uh, read those and then uh, also come up with questions. Um, and then if you haven't uh, ordered the liberation of palm of your hand, please do that. Uh, so you can have that book um, you know, as soon as possible because that's gonna be a ongoing uh, resource for you. Okay, so maybe that's it. Thank you very much for uh, your patience and your hard work. And we'll see you next week.